Thanks for tuning in, and thanks to the International Climate and Cryosphere Initiative for hosting this session at COP28 in the UAE. I'm Jason Box, a climatologist and glaciologist at the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland, leading the Arctic Climate Change Indicators Chapter of the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program's forthcoming report on Arctic climate issues of concern. This chapter includes contributions from 14 international experts across Arctic climatology. The Arctic climate system, as a cold pole of the Earth's planetary heat engine, has undergone profound physical changes since the mid-1980s. In the Arctic, it's only after the 1980s that the anthropogenic warming signal becomes obvious, punching through the noise. I'll now briefly summarize changes in more than 10 observational indicators of Arctic climate, most spanning the 44-year period, 1979 to 2022, that covers the transition to a rapidly warming new Arctic. Owing to amplifying feedbacks and an increase in winter warm episodes, the Arctic surface warming rate in the recent two decades has exceeded four times that of the global average. Over the area where sea ice loss is greatest, the temperature increase is more than seven times global. Around Greenland, the temperature increase since 1979 is twice global. The observational data exhibit widespread and statistically significant warming trends in air temperature and permafrost temperatures. We find increasing rainfall at the expense of snowfall, given how the melting point threshold is being crossed more often as climate warms, and how more moisture and heat are being pumped into the Arctic atmosphere from more north-south heat exchanges. The warmer atmosphere can hold and discharge more moisture in extreme rain and snowfall events we now witness more often than in the past. Satellite imaging has recorded a greening of Arctic tundra, driven by increased air temperature and precipitation, and field studies find increases in Arctic shrub heights from improved growing conditions of woody stem plants, along with a shorter snow cover season. Increased rates of Arctic coastline erosion are driven by permafrost degradation and more wave action, that results from declining sea ice area and thickness. Glacier ice volume continues declining across the Arctic, led by a reduction in Greenland ice and followed in Arctic ice loss rate by Alaska and Arctic Canada. Notice, for example, how the rate of ice losses from the Russian high Arctic, or Svalbard, are increasing with time. This pattern of accelerating ice loss is consistent among all Arctic regions as the glacier response is relatively slow because of their massive cold content that clearly shows signs of catching up with warming air and sea temperatures. Greenland remains Earth's largest regional contributor to global sea level rise, producing an even larger sea rise than from the much larger ice sheet in Antarctica. We find that increased wildfire area that is not only a major ecosystem disruptor and source of black carbon soot, but carbon emissions from fire combined with carbon emissions from permafrost degradation together are amplifying global warming. The more global warming, the more Arctic carbon release and then some more global warming in a feedback process. Increasing fire and permafrost carbon emissions are not well captured by climate models that policy relies on as planning tools for the future. The weakness of modeling is not from lack of diligence on the part of science. It's for reasons like the model resolution tends to be too coarse to resolve the wavy jet stream and stuck jet stream patterns that produce extremes. Furthermore, the global carbon cycle is not well accounted for yet in climate models. 
And it's not the model's fault that not all known amplifying or damping factors are yet accounted. The issue is that in a lot of cases, we lack the physics and mathematical expressions to mimic how sensitive nature really is. Consequently, climate and Earth system models offer a mere facsimile of the infinite fidelity of nature. The models lack the sensitivity and detail we see when we venture to the Arctic. With model future ice loss being reported faster each time the models are upgraded, the implication is that society likely needs to prepare for more sea level rise. Modeling the future is hard, and when we compare how well modeling captures past ice and carbon changes, we get the clear impression that future warming and ice loss can come faster than forecast. The Arctic is responding to human effects on the climate system more rapidly than practically any other region on Earth, and the changes in the far north are being felt beyond the Arctic. Mounting evidence is linking rapid Arctic warming to mid-latitude weather extremes. Why is that the strength of the jet stream depends on the Arctic being colder than the mid-latitudes? Given the Arctic is warming faster than the mid-latitudes means that the jet stream is slowing down, becoming more wavy south-north, and getting stuck in highly amplified wave patterns that can produce either extreme dry or wet conditions, extreme heat, or even extreme cold, depending on one's location relative to the wave pattern. The global climate disruption feeding into Arctic-driven changes of mid-latitude weather already threatens the food and water security for billions of people and countless other species. Details about the overview I've presented here, including chapters about extremes, changing Arctic hydrology, or Arctic ocean acidification, appear in the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program's 2024 report on Arctic climate issues of concern. Thanks for tuning in and do visit amap.no for more information.